it strikes me as I give these speeches and I talk to people, because I remember a time when I had to beg people to care about what I did or what I was involved in. Nobody cared about politics. They cared like, you know, a couple months leading up to an election. But that's about it. The rest of the time is like it was boring, it was this, it was that. Now everything is political, unfortunately. Everything has become political. One of, one of the consequences of that is that all the places where people used to be able to gather and get to know one another beyond politics uh, have been wiped out. And that's a big deal because it goes to the core of what it means to be a nation. And you talk about national conservatism, I think it begins by defining what does nationhood mean? Is it just a geographic outline of some random lines that were drawn or what have you? And, and you know, people that, it, the nationhood is so much more than just that. It's certainly an element of it. And that's why I think things like border security are so critical. If you basically do not care about borders, you do basically don't care about who comes in, then you basically mean you really don't care about the, the whole concept of nationhood. But a nation at its core is basically a group of people who may be very different from one another, have different ideas and different principles and different values and different goals from different places, who agree to live together under a common set of rules. I mean, at its, at its, if you were to define what does a nation mean, it means that at its very sort of academic, elemental nature. And that's an important concept that we've forgotten. Why have we forgotten that? And what has brought us to this point? I imagine you've had a lot of speakers already leading you up to this, but I wanted to give you my view of it. I'm not a, a sociologist. I'm not a demographer. But I need to know a little bit about it, at least at an amateur level, to understand what's happening in American politics today and why everything's become so hyper-political. And I think you have to go back all the way to the end of the Cold War era. So the Cold War is over. I grew up in the 80s. The 1980s were a time uh, for those, uh, and I think just looking around, I don't want to prejudge anyone, but I would say about half of you remember the 1980s, and the other half have seen something about it on one of those CNN specials where they do, you know, the 80s. And, um, I would just say that I thought the 80s were better than the 70s simply because we didn't have to endure disco music. Some people like disco music. It's not my thing, you know, but... Uh, we had our own problems. But going back to the, to the point of the 80s, I grew up in the 80s and the whole world was defined by this battle between the Soviet Union and the United States, ideological, potentially militarily, et cetera. And suddenly, overnight, if you recall what that felt like, it was my freshman year in college, the entire world changed. Overnight, it was like communism has been defeated and there was this notion that developed that from that point forward, history was over and everyone was going to be a liberal, free enterprise economy and democracy. That that was now going to become the new world order. And that became sort of a governing consensus across the political spectrum. That that's the way things were always going to be. But the people who can, in fact, I remember one of the lines that they used to say all the time was, no two countries with a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. Well, we know that's no longer true. There's McDonald's in Ukraine and there was McDonald's in Russia, I don't know what they call them anymore, but what they used to be. And that sort of simplistic notion over, over forgot two things. The first and most important is human nature. The most fascinating thing about human nature is this. Everything has changed. The way people dress, the way they eat, the way they speak, the way they live their daily lives. So much has changed. But the one thing that's true today as it was 5,500 years ago is human nature. Human nature will never change. And part of human nature is the desire to belong, the desire to be a part of something bigger than yourselves. It's the reason why we start clubs. That's the reason why we root for teams. We are constantly, as human beings, as biological creatures, looking for connection to others. Nationhood is one of the most important connections one can have with other people. And the reason why these people forgot it is they suddenly began to think, and I think this became sort of a bipartisan view of the world was, from now on, we are really all going to just basically be citizens of the world. We're going to all live in the same economy. National rules are not going to be nearly as important as our ability to interact with people from halfway around the world. And we're all going to be united by common economic interests and common economic uh, futures. And there really was this belief that it was the end of history and all of 5,500 years of human nature and human history had been wiped out and everything new, everything was going to be new moving forward. It was a terrible mistake. No one told the Chinese, who come from an ancient culture that takes tremendous pride in over a thousand years of being one of the world's most powerful countries about this new world order. They took advantage of it, all of its, all of its benefits they fully assumed, but of course none of its responsibilities. 
Eventually, it would be logical that Vladimir Putin and, and Russia and the Russian Federation would seek to recapture what they believed to be their national interest, especially as it conflicted with ours and that of the rest of the world. But human nature didn't end at the end of the Cold War. The other thing that didn't end is the importance of national interest. That just because something was good for the rest of the world or something was good in the laboratory of free enterprise didn't always translate to something that was in the national interest. It is, in fact, I believe, one of the biggest challenges facing conservatism as we define it in American politics today. Because I'm not a so I hate socialism. I despise it. It is nothing but a source of misery and suffering and max, at max, mass exile and, and immigration and destructive to the human spirit. But I also understand that free enterprise works because it always allocates resources to its most efficient use. Money in free enterprise is always going to go to the most efficient use. One of the big challenges facing conservatives today is what happens? What happens when the market outcome, the most efficient outcome, is not aligned with your national interest? And when I say that, sometimes people start to squirm or they get a little bit uncomfortable. Certainly the Wall Street Journal editorial board does. And here's why, because in, in the view of, that they have is like everything can be solved by economics. And it's just not true. We are more than just consumers. We are more than just economic creatures. But what happens? <laughs> what happens when the most efficient outcome, the market outcome, does not align with your national interest? I've been challenged. Well, give me an example. OK. It's cheaper to buy 83% of the active ingredients in our basic pharmaceuticals, having them made in China, a lot cheaper, a lot more efficient. Is that in our national interest? Is it in our national interest to depend on China for an overwhelming majority of the world's rare earth minerals? We've already made these decisions before whether we want to pretend we do or not. Why don't we build F-35s in Indonesia or Vietnam? Why don't we build ships there for that matter? Because someone decided it would be cheaper to do it in one of these other countries, but we have to be able to make our own F-35s. We have to be able to make our own aircraft carriers. We've already made that decision in other realms, but we've forgotten it in so many. We forgot that it's in our nation's national interest to care about where the food we eat is produced. It's in our nation's natural interest to have an industrial capacity. And so that disconnect emerged from that post-Cold War consensus that it really didn't matter anymore where things were made or who made them. The second thing that overlooked is not just pure economics from that perspective, is it not in our national interest? Is it possible to even be a strong country without having strong families and strong communities? The answer is overwhelmingly no. There's no evidence in 5,500 years of human history that any culture, society, or nation can be strong if it's not both an industrial power, but also has strong families and strong communities. So if you accept that as true, which I think there is zero evidence for the fact that, it, that, that it's possible to be strong without strong families and strong communities, then you have to ask yourself the second question. Is it possible to have strong families and strong communities without having dignified jobs? And the answer, I think, is overwhelmingly no. And we're seeing that play out today. It is corrosive to the human spirit when you don't have dignified work available. And I think history proves that over and over again, and so does modern times. Because if that were not true, then there's no difference, and it's probably the, one of the fundamental differences between socialists and leftists and those of us on the right, and that is their belief that it doesn't really matter where the money you have comes from. Whether it's a government stimulus check or a government welfare program or a job, the important thing is you just got 100 bucks, and with it you can buy things. But we know better because human history tells us that. If that $100 is the product of your work, of your labor, of something you put into it, it means something to the person. It has an element of it that is the glue that holds communities together. It's the kind of thing that makes it possible to start a family and be a part of a community. But when you take it away, it becomes corrosive and destructive. And so as we made these economic decisions on the basis of what the most efficient allocation of capital is, one of the things people forgot is, but what happens if one of the byproducts of that decision is that it leaves millions and millions of people unable to acquire dignified work? And that was one of the fundamental things that we've seen play out over the last 25 years. It's one of the best ways to explain some of the anger and frustration and alienation that exists in American politics and society today. Is that we have millions and millions of people who saw their grandfathers work 
at a company, retire with dignity with a pension and, and be able to, to, to leave their kids better off than themselves. Perhaps they saw their parents do the same. But now they're being told, your job is gone. But don't worry, you can learn how to code and have, find a much, much better paying job. That's what the economic theory tells us. That's not how things worked out in the real world. So this disconnect continued. You lost industrial capacity, which you cannot be a great power without being an industrial power. You lost the dignity of work, which became corrosive to society and the family. And the result is our national interest was undermined. And so one of the great realignments that's happening in American politics today is the disconnect between the left and right, which is not as simple as it used to be. Listen, you are in Miami-Dade County. This is a majority Democrat county. It has been forever. And so it is impossible to grow up here the way I did and not know people on the left and not know people that are Democrats. And for years, sort of the dividing line, at least on economics, between left and right was, you know, one group wanted higher taxes, one wanted less. One wanted more government regulation, one wanted less. That was the dividing line, and that still remains a divide. But today it's so much deeper than that. And you ask yourself, why has it gone even deeper than it used to be? The divide is no longer between simple ideology. The divide that's now developing is between common sense, the common sense developed from living in the real world and interacting with real people, and the lunacy that develops when the people who were taught by you know, crazy professors are now 30-something years of age and are running major corporations or are elected to office or are involved in setting you know, a public opinion in America as commentators. And so now what you're seeing this divide play out over and over again is not simply on economics. It is basically a call to a nation to reject not just our traditions and our values and the time-tested principles of 240 years of the most successful republic in human history, but to reject the lessons, the fundamental truths of what works and what doesn't from 50, 500 years of human history. And look, it is tempting to every generation to believe that they have figured it out that everyone before you had it wrong, everyone before you was ridiculous, but you somehow are enlightened. That somehow after, you know, 35 or 40 years of life, you have discovered some hidden truth about humanity that everyone else for 5,500 years had not figured out. And so today we are subjected to things like, there are such things as pregnant men. As of, what is it, almost 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time? Are we on Standard or Daylight Time? I don't remember, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> as of almost 10 o'clock today, as far as I know, every single human being that's ever been born was born of a biological woman. And yet we have not just commentators, not just professors, we have the Centers for Disease Control, we have the, uh, some, the, the prominent public health agency in America who insists on using the term pregnant people. Well, I can assure you that that's never happened. It's never happened. It's, but it's more than just annoying. People say, well, that's just, who cares? It's semantics. The problem is it's not just isolated. It moves from there to all kinds of other realms, like the idea, for example, that children don't really have to be raised by parents and families. We can raise them as a society. We can raise them in schools and with the right programming on television and with the right celebrity messaging on social media, we can raise productive, responsible human beings. We're learning the hard way that that's not true. On issue after issue, it's more than just annoying, it's having real impacts. And so this realignment that's happening in American politics is not ideological. It is largely the divide between people who work for a living who live in the real world, who have to raise their children, and people who live in a fantasy world, and people who have the affluence and, and the buffer necessary to worry about things that do not really matter and to focus on things that really aren't true. It's the divide between laptop liberals and, frankly, Marxist misfits who make enough money to be able to indulge in these fantasies about how great it's gonna be when all of us drive an electric car and our roofs are covered with solar panels and people who had to get up this morning and drive to work and will have to do so for the next 25 years in a car powered by fossil fuels like 98% of Americans will have to do this morning. It's a difference 
during the pandemic between the people that were, had the luxury of working from home, and many still are. They kind of figured out, hey, what I do, I can do from my bedroom and my underwear. All I need is a Wi-Fi connection and a laptop. And the people who worked at a job where you couldn't do it remotely. You can't drive a truck from home. You can't uh, work in retail from home. You can't put out fires as a firefighter from home. You can't be a police officer from home. And so that divide has continued to develop, but the, power, the problem is the power imbalance. It is unfortunate, but it is true that a small, out of touch elite are now in charge of every major institution in American society. And what they're engaged in, which I'm convinced most of them don't even realize or maybe don't want to realize, is Marxism. That's strong to say, maybe this audience isn't outraged by it. Sometimes you say it in front of people and you hear gasp, Marxism, <gasps> come on, that's a smear. Well, let me tell you something. Marxism is a lot more than just socialism. Socialism is an economic model. Marxism is a power model. Socialism is government engagement in our economy, and it is possible, though I don't believe I think often misrepresented and not entirely successful to say, okay, we're going to have elections and we're going to choose between a very socialist person and a semi-socialist person. Because I think in many parts of the world what we would view as their economic model, we would characterize as socialism. But what they really are are high tax places with big government spending programs, big government safety nets and the like. But socialism is an economic model. Marxism is a power structure. And what Marxism basically is about is the following. We need to control people. People need to be controlled, and they need to be controlled by a handful of people that are smarter, are better, are, are more moral in some ways, because if you don't control people, they'll do things like be unequal to each other. They'll hoard all the wealth. They'll discriminate against one another. They won't allocate resources in the proper way. And so we have to have control, and not just over the economy. We have to have control over everything. So we have to have schools that are basically teaching this from a very young age. Education is important, but indoctrination is more important. It is important for us to get in front of people when they're very young and begin to shape and mold their minds. And we cannot allow their parents to interfere in that. In fact, we have to teach them that your parents don't know what they're talking about. They're a product of a, you know, an old era. They, they got it all wrong. And trust me, your parents don't know. The schools won't be enough. We have to get the whole of society to support us in this endeavor. So we need to make sure that the entertainers and the cultural influencers and everybody else is also reinforcing those messages. That your parents don't know what they're talking about and all these old-fashioned things are not just not true, they're actually evil. They're bad for you guys. Don't listen to them. You have to control media and the messaging. We can't, you, Marxism has never tolerated counter-messaging. It's subversive. In some places, they call it counter-revolutionary. In America, they call it hateful and uh, dangerous and extremism, and I guess now neo-fascism. But basically, we cannot tolerate dissent. We cannot tolerate anybody opposing, or po opposing points of view. Once you say that they're dangerous to, and destructive, you have the power to silence it, and you can justify it in that way. They have to control government. There's no doubt about it, which means that Yes, we're, we, we're for elections as long as we win. If we lose, we lost because you suppressed the vote. Because the laws of some state didn't allow people to vote and if they had voted, the outcome would be different. And that's what we're living through right now. And some people say, oh, you're just paranoid because uh, you know, you've been raised your whole life around people that lost their country to Marxism. Well, yeah, maybe, but just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, right? Remember that line? <laughs> And uh, But I don't call it paranoia. I call it, I've seen this movie before. It's just like these horror movies, right? Like, you know, listen, don't go in that closet. Why are you going in that closet? <laughs> no one survives opening the door to that closet. He's either in the closet or right behind you when you open the closet door. I've seen the movie before. And when I say I've seen it, I've seen it through the eyes of the people I live around. You're in Miami-Dade County. There's a large number, tens, hundreds of thousands of people who live in this community who lost their country to Marxism in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Venezuela, 
And in every one of these cases, the people who took over the country and destroyed it, they never emerged early on and said, I am a Marxist. Join our Marxist revolution. In Cuba, Fidel Castro said, I'm a Democrat. I don't even want power. Fidel Castro, I don't even want to be in power. I just want to you know, bring Cuba back, and, and then we're going to turn it over to elected people, and I'm going to go off and you know, I don't know what he said he was going to go do. But they never said that until they did. And so it manifests in different ways. But it is, in my view, that's what's happening today. So you have two things happening at the same time. You have this movement to, to, to empower itself of America that is clearly inspired by Marxism, whether they call it that or not. And at the same time, you have this massive disconnect between the people in power and the people that are governed. It is, to me, the most stunning things in American politics today is not the differences of opinion on issues. It is the disconnect between what people on Capitol Hill in this bubble surrounded by this impenetrable force field in which logic and common sense cannot penetrate. People that live there and this journey I take every week back and forth to live around real people who never talk to me about the things that we spend the majority of our time fighting over. Never. As an example, I Look, I deliberately, now I do I have to live my life that way because that's where I'm from, that's what I'm surrounded by, that's what my family is, but that's also the neighborhood I live in, the people I interact with. And out there in my interactions with people, I've heard people complain about a lot of things, some of which have nothing to do with government, some of which, which, which do. What I've never heard people say is, damn it, you guys need to get up there right now and make sure you pass a bill that hires 87,000 IRS agents and gives us tax credits so we can finally own an electric car. I, I just don't think there's this mass uprising in America for these things. But that is generally what the Democratic Party just spent the bulk of their remaining political capital on. In about a few days, we'll have a vote on enshrining same-sex marriage in the, in, the, in the laws of this country. And look, you know, people have different views on that issue. Okay. But that fight like happened, the Supreme Court ruled, there's not a single state in the country, not one, trying to pass a law to challenge it. There's not a single case working its way up the courts, not one. And yet that's, what, that's one of the last things other than funding, keeping government funded, and that, that the Senate leadership under Democrats is going to prioritize as a vote. And the list goes on. I mean, you can go on, but before that last year, it was a voting rights bill because somehow there was these laws that Joe Biden says were the equivalent of Jim Crow. Or what did he call it, Jim Eagle? Remember that? It was weird. <laughs> but Jim Crow, and, and if you weren't for the bill they wanted that basically put the federal government in charge of elections in places like, and they cited Georgia and Florida, then you were, in fa you were no better than the segregationists. And then we have a primary, and Georgia has like this record turnout of voters that have come out there and in other places. Spent a bunch of time on that. They spent months trying to pass a $4 trillion Build Back Better, which basically codified socialism in, into our laws of our country. So you have the disconnect between the priorities of these people and everybody else. And the reason why is very simple. Their agenda is entirely controlled by the interests and the priorities of laptop liberals and Marxist misfits. The laptop liberals are the people that provide them the staffers, the activist class, the commentator class, the policy class, and they think these people reflect America. Where you really see it play out is these activists that claim, I speak on behalf of this disadvantaged group of Americans. There's a disconnect between the people they claim to speak on behalf of and the activists and the leaders of these activist groups. So you have that disconnect going on, and it's massive. And it plays out every single day, not just on the solutions they arrive at, but on the priorities. And then you have these overwhelming majority of Americans who work for a living, who just want to live normal lives, who want to be able to have influence over what their kids are taught in school and how they raise their families. And they look towards politics and they say that it's completely abandoned them, including the many on the Democratic Party many of whom can no longer have maybe voted for Democrats their entire lives for a lot of different reasons. I hear it all the time from some people. And they'll tell you, I used to be a Democrat because the Democrat is the, is the party of working people and the Republicans are the party of, of millionaires. And now I think they realize the, the Democratic Party is not the party of working people. 
Democratic Party today is the party of affluent elites that live on the Upper West Side, that live in West Beverly Hills, and who have the luxury of worrying about things that don't matter to people in daily life. So that's a huge disconnect in American politics. Now, I'm a Republican. Does that mean that we automatically benefit from it? Not necessarily, maybe in one election, because you're not them. But not being them is not enough, which is really at the core of what this group tries to do and what I hope we'll do more of um, in the Senate, and that is how do we create a new governing consensus in America that reflects the interest of the overwhelming majority of our people? An overwhelming majority of people that do not define themselves by the color of their skin or their ethnicity, whose goal in life is not to make billions of dollars, who don't spend all day checking their cell phone to see how Wall Street is performing, because their life isn't going to really change very dramatically whether the, you know, the stock market is up or down that very day. But overwhelming majority of people that want out of life things that are very simple and essential, but critical and important. They want to basically get married, start a family, own a home in a safe neighborhood, retire with dignity, and leave their children with a chance to be better off than themselves. And in the process, they want to be able to have enough time and resources to enjoy some simple and important things, like going to a college football game or fishing, like taking a vacation somewhere once a year. And I speak to you about those basic principles because they've defined my life. When people talk to me about the American dream, a lot of times people think the American dream means how many things do you own? How many houses do you have? How many cars, electric or otherwise, do you own? That has never been the American dream. The American dream is about being able to achieve happiness as you define it. And for millions and millions and millions of people, happiness has nothing to do with the accumulation of wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth. If, there's nothing wrong with earning and working hard. And for some people, that, that's part of their dream. But for the overwhelming majority of people, what they really want are the simple things that make life worth living, that make life enjoyable and memorable and to leave their kids better off than themselves. And so the goal and the task of those of us who call ourselves national conservatives, who believe in that, is how do you create a nation whose public policies are geared towards the common good of making that possible for millions and millions and millions of people? That has to be the goal. Because if the goal is not to be the other people, if the goal is they're crazy, we're not, vote for me, that'll win you some elections. It will not win you the future. It will not save this country. And when I get to that point, which is usually where I start concluding, people say, well, save the country. I mean, do you mean, because there is a lot of fear out there that America is falling apart. And I would always caveat it by saying, one of the things that's been true about America for about 150 years now for certain is that every generation or every generation once they come to leadership is under this obsessive fear that somehow we're gonna be overtaken and that America's about to crumble. And that doesn't mean that every generation hasn't had a special task. What we have here is special and it's different. It's not a throwaway line. A lot of people like to say, there's the greatest country in the world, but they never articulate why. We're not the greatest, there's not, look, again, I celebrate wealth. We, people that work really hard have this great idea or come up with something and they really are successful. I, we celebrate that, we don't condemn it, we don't demonize it. But that's not what makes us unique. Every country in the world has rich people. Some would say, well, the size of our economy, the power of our military, all true. But there have been powerful militaries before from a relative perspective, perhaps some more powerful than ours, in, relatively speaking, from their time and era. What makes us unique and special is that never in the history of man has there been a place where so many different people with so many differences in background, in belief, in lifestyle, have been able to share a nation where so many have been able to prosper and achieve happiness. That's really truly at the core of what makes us exceptional. And all of the other things, the economy, the military, the geopolitical influence, all the other things flow from that. All the other things flow from the fact that it's a special country. And sometimes I think it's easy to take that for granted. Because when all you've ever known is freedom, liberty, prosperity, you think, well, this is the natural order of things. But when you are raised, surrounded by people who know what life is like in other places, it's much harder to take it for granted. It's much harder to take it for granted. And you find yourself today in a county where there are hundreds of thousands of people that know what life is like in other places. 
and so they know how special and unique this country truly is. And all of that, and, and in the end, that is actually the glue that's always held America together. American has never been a race or an ethnicity. American has never been based on where were you born or where were your parents born or what's your last name or what's your blood and lineage. American has been the home of people who came here from all over the world or moved halfway across this very country because they could not be who they believed they were meant to be, who they wanted to be in the nation of their birth, in the city of their birth, in the region of their birth, or under the current circumstances of their life. And America was the one place on earth where people, no matter where they started out, were able to go as far as their talent and their work will take them. And that honestly is the glue that has held us together as a nation. It is our binding common identity. And it's the number one thing that this modern Marxism attacks. It attacks it by telling you that the most important thing about you is the color of your skin. It attacks it by saying the most important thing about you is your ethnicity. And that simply isn't how people live. When they ask me, are you surprised at the gains the GOP has made among Hispanic voters? The answer is, I'm not. Because for most Hispanics who wake up in the morning, their primary identity that day will not be Hispanic. Their primary identity that day is father and mother, husband and wife, small business owner, worker, volunteer at the PTA or the Little League team, head of the Rotary Club, deacon at their church. That becomes part of their primary identity. And we have to recapture that in order to recapture the, the notion of nationhood. I don't think all is negative. When I talk about a, a, a common uh, governing consensus, we've had that before. We've had periods of time in our history where the governing consensus is shattered. It leads to a great tumultuous moment. And then a new governing consensus emerges. And this governing consensus is like a highway. It has a left lane, it has a right lane, and it has these barriers to keep you from getting into the oncoming traffic, going the other way. And you operate within those barriers. But those barriers have been blown up. And there no longer is a left lane and a right lane. It's just all of these six or seven multifaceted lanes, some running in opposite directions, some going sideways. And what this country desperately needs is a new governing consensus that sort of understands the reality of the 21st century. The reality of the 21st centuries are as follows. We are now headed full steam into a new world in which the United States has a near-peer competitor, unlike any we've ever faced. China today poses a near-peer competitiveness to the United States that the Soviet Union never did. And the sooner we wake up to that reality and deal with it, the better, because it's almost too late. We live in a world where because of a pandemic and because of China, people are starting to wake up and realize, hey, it really does matter where things are made. It really does matter where our food comes from. It really does matter how much energy we're able to produce for ourselves. It really does matter what things we are able to manufacture, not just invent. It really does matter what kind of jobs people have and whether they are here or somewhere else. It really does matter whether coming into this country has to be through a process that's orderly, not chaos. These things really do matter. We're ending into an era where people realize all of these ideas that percolated out of the faculty club are really crazy. Like, for example, if you don't prosecute and arrest criminals, you're going to have a lot of crime. If, if, you, if children are not raised in strong and stable families, it doesn't matter how much their parents make. Those kids are not going to grow up to be productive people. Some may grow up not valuing life, including their own. It really does matter. It is an era in which common sense and the insanity of complacency, which is no other way to describe it. Some people thought that the world was always going to be the way they knew it, and so we now had the luxury of entertaining fantasies and ridiculousness and injecting it into our public policy. But common sense is now running into it, and it's realigning not just American politics, but American society. And so through, we live through a pandemic where people that maybe voted for all kinds of leaders who wanted higher taxes and more social spending now saw those leaders saying, we don't need to open schools. Schools can be kept closed. And would have kept it that way forever. 
We, people lived through a pandemic where they told businesses, not only can you not open, but we don't know when you're going to be able to reopen or operate or function. Where, people, where leaders told people, if you're in the streets burning things down in a riot, you don't need to wear a mask. And if you wear a mask and it's just a mask to hide your identity so they can't arrest you, that's fine too. But if you're going to get together on Sunday for church, we're going to have to crack down on you. So the insanity and the common sense have run into each other. And a growing number of Americans have realized disconnect. And they're looking for a new home. And that doesn't mean that on a checklist of issues, they'll agree with us on everything. Maybe they think the corporate tax rate should be 27 instead of 25. Maybe they have different views on different things. But there is out there waiting to be formed a governing consensus in this country of people that want to live in a place where common sense and time-tested values guide our public policy. And the other thing I think you're going to see a tremendous energy behind is the concept of federalism. People wouldn't call it that. But the notion that to the extent government is going to play a role in setting the rules for your life, it should be a government you can access. People have realized how terrible the world would have been if your local policies on who wear masks and what can reopen was set by a doctor working for the government who you were never going to get to speak to, or a congresswoman from San Francisco or a senator from New York. And so I think in many, they're grateful in Florida that here, those policies were set by a governor who's not out of his mind, by a state legislature of normal people, and by local leaders that they could scream at and vote out of office if they did the wrong thing. People have come to realize maybe it's not a good idea for the federal government to be in charge of our schools because we're never going to be able to influence the people that decide what happened there. But if it's a school board, we can vote a bunch of them out of office, like just happened when 20 people were voted out of office in school boards in Florida in August of this year. So the return of government as close to people as possible and a return to the notions of common sense and time-tested values are there for the taking in terms of forming a governing consensus for our country and its future. But it will not happen on its own. And it will do those in my party no good to win a majority simply to perpetuate the mistakes that the left has made in their time in power. It is not enough to just win a majority. It's not enough to just win elections. We have to outline a vision of the future that captures the hopes and dreams of everyday people and also paints a picture of the kind of future that made America unique and special. And at the core of all of it is inspiring people to reach for that future because we are all members of the same nation. Because at the core of everything we're talking about is not just what makes our individual lives better, but what can make the life of all of us better, what promotes the common good. The common good of what? The common good of a nation. The common good of the United States of America. The common good of the place we all call home. The common good of the place we're all going to call home for the rest of our lives. Because there's nowhere else to go. And I could argue to you that the stakes are global. Because if America were to decline, there's nothing left to replace us. Except a godless communist regime that doesn't care about the rights of its own people. But for Americans, for those of us who are going to call this place home, it has to be a common good based not simply on what's good for the economy in any particular period of time, but what's good for the economy for the country. And that's been a huge challenge in trying to articulate it. When I tell people I believe in economic growth and prosperity, that's why I believe in free enterprise. But you can't just have wealth. You, growth alone is important. Growth is important, but growth alone is not enough. It has, to be, it has to be the kind of growth that also creates good-paying, dignified work for millions of people. Because that's the common good, and that's what holds you together as a nation. Yes, I want things to be made in the most efficient way possible. I want investment to flow to the most efficient location. But it also has to be in a way that promotes the common good and doesn't leave us dependent on supply chains that could be denied to us by a pandemic or by a prelude to a war. Yes, we have no problem exporting food to other countries. We have no problem importing goods that you can't find here. 
but we have to be able to feed our own people and power our own industries because that's in our national interest. Otherwise, you become dependent on other nations and the decisions they make. These are big decisions. They challenge 30 years of orthodoxy in both political parties, and it will be, not be easy to undo because to date, all of the think tanks, all of the, I say all, most of the think tanks, most of the public policy ideas that are percolating, all come from products of an era that is over and that has been disproven. And so for those of us who believe in these causes and things of this nature, the challenge of today is extraordinary. Because our job is not just to get tax policy right or military policy right. Our challenge is to craft a vision of America's future built on a governing consensus that captures what holds us together as a nation, what's important for our country, and what allows us to persevere so that the American miracle survives for one generation more. I believe we'll get it right. I believe it won't be easy. It'll take a lot of work and some time, but I believe we'll get it right. And the reason why I do is because we have no choice. We have no choice. There's nowhere else for us to go. There is no alternative to America, for us individually or for the world. And so gatherings like this are critical because they invite, encourage, challenge, and create the format by which the ideas behind that common good consensus for the 21st century can be, can be produced. And if anything excites me about this year is that it seems to be potentially electing to Congress and to the Senate new voices who are a product of this new reality. I'll close with this. I believe we'll get it right with all my heart because I can't even fathom the alternative. I can't fathom an alternative in which America goes into decline, what the world would look like for our children. Whether we realize it on a daily basis or not, almost everyone on earth, but certainly every single American, is the beneficiary of a world in which America is the most powerful and influential country in ways that sometimes don't even fully perceive. And so, for us, the, we have an extraordinarily important vested interest in ensuring that that continues. But I actually think we'll get it right, and when we do get it right, I actually think our children and our grandchildren will have the opportunity to be the freest and most prosperous people that have ever lived. And that's an exciting opportunity to be a part of. Most of us, no longer how, how young we are, may not fully live to see that new American century. But if we do what needs to be done, then we're going to leave for our children what was left to us, what every generation has left for the next in our entire history, the single greatest country in all of human history. If we fail, we'll be the first generation that leaves our children worse off than ourselves. So the work you do and the work you're doing and the format you're creating for these debates and these conversations to happen are critically important. And I encourage you to continue to do it. I look forward to being a part of it in every way I can. And I look forward to encouraging more people to enter the public sphere who have these ideas and the ability to articulate common sense into public policy that furthers the national interest and the common good. Thank you for the chance to speak to you today. God bless all of you. Thank you.